Thank you very much for coming to this uh, presidential lecture. Today we are happy to have uh, Professor Bela from the ITMO University in St. Petersburg with us. Uh, I give you a brief background uh, so that you know whom you're listening to. Um, he received his uh, degree actually from the ITMO University in, as you said, computer science or IT uh, in 2000. Then did two PhD degrees, one in optics uh, in Russia and another one in radio engineering, which he did in Finland. In between, he worked in industry uh, with various companies, with Samsung in South Korea, but also uh, with the Robert Bosch uh, company. From 2005 until 2012, he was uh, working in the UK at Queen's Mary University in London. And uh, currently, he's the Dean of the Physics and Engineering Faculty and the head of the Research Center of Nanophotonics and Metamaterials uh, at ITMO. Uh, his research interests include metamaterials, plasmonics, electromagnetics, uh, nanophotonics, and uh, nanostructures. And today, he's going to talk to us about the recent progress in uh, nanophotonics for new optical technology. Thank you very much for coming. We're looking forward to this. Well, thank you very much for introduction. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here. It's my first time uh, when I'm visiting Japan. Yeah, it's my my old dream. It's realized, and I'm really happy to be here in uh, Oist in Okinawa. Uh, I hope uh, that you will get some interesting information today about nanophotonics I will be talking about. But before I start about some scientific topics, I would like to show the place uh, from which I just came. Yes, so I'm representing ITMO University from St. Petersburg, Russia. I would say it's right across from here, the other side of Russia. It's very, very close to the North Pole, St. Petersburg city. It's uh, actually second uh, city in Russia in terms of number of inhabitants. Uh, and the people who are living there, and actually it's just six millions of us, and it used to be called cultural capital of Russia, window to, Euro uh, to Europe, and so on. It was built uh, in particular uh, by Peter the Great in order to have connection between Russian country and Europe. Yeah? And uh, our university, ITMO University, is actually sixth university in Russia in terms of optics and computer science in our ratings. Yeah, so uh, we have beautiful. Uh, buildings in the city. We have also some nice science, which I will be showing to you today. Uh, all they are combined. Actually, our laboratory, our research center, which is called Center of Nanophotonics and Metamaterials, is located right in the heart of the city, right? This is a photo which is taken from when you go out from Hermitage and see the photos. If you cannot recognize it, I will help you a little bit. Yeah? So we have these beautiful bridges in front for those who have been to St. Petersburg. Yeah? They are working right at this beautiful environment. So the lab is located right there. But not only this lab in particular contributed to what I will be talking today about. Yeah, We are working in very, very close collaboration with different groups around the world. I would like to acknowledge our very long collaboration with Australian National University, in particular with Yuri Kivshar. We are working with Boris Chichkov from Germany, uh, Arseniy Kuznetsov from Singapore, and uh, recently from, uh, with Anwar Zafido from University of Texas. So not everything what was, I was will be showing today was done in particular in St. Petersburg, but some of the things, some samples were taken from the colleagues, some of the things were measured in the different places. So we're working in this purely uh, international environment right now. All right, in order to start, most of the things I will be talking today will be devoted to some nanoparticles, yeah? And actually, in the nanoparticles, what they can do, they usually scatter. Yeah? And actually, scattering of nanoparticles historically split it in the, into the, like a two different phenomena. First is relay scattering, then the nanoparticle is much, much smaller than the wavelength. And this is actually the reason this, of this phenomena, why uh, the sky is blue, yeah? because of the scattering, so on and so forth. But actually, most of the things today will be devoted to so-called mis-scattering. This happens then the nanoparticles' dimensions are comparable or a little bit larger than the wavelengths. And you have many, many different scattering peaks, yeah? And usually, you even, in the nature, you cannot distinguish them. For example, scattering from nanoparticles from the clouds, they create a white color of the clouds for us, yeah? But in reality, there are really, really nice resonance depending on the dimensions of these nanoparticles, which we'll be talking today about. Uh, fundamentally, from mathematics, 
if you just solve mathematical problem of scattering of the sphere, like a plane wave is coming and scattering the sphere, you can write some mathematical formula with some coefficients, but basically you can uh, identify different multiples and usually conventionally the dominant scattering comes from electrical mode. Then uh, you have a certain electrical dipole and this electrical dipole dictates the scattering. Actually, the magnetic mode is usually avoided because for small particle, for relay scattering, it doesn't matter at all. And even in optics, if you, I tell to anybody, okay, can we have nanoparticle with some magnetic properties? You usually will tell me, okay, no, it's impossible because there are no magnetic properties for visible domain, for example. Yeah, but actually I will show you that it's quite possible and it's possible to have magnetic mode, but it will be a little bit different. You will have displacement currents which are flowing around this and you will have magnetic moment of the whole nanoparticle itself. You don't have a response or magnetic response of the material, but you do have magnetic response of the nanoparticle itself. Let's further consider this, yeah? So usually in nanophotonics, if we consider nanoparticles, the people are using nanoparticle of noble metals, of gold or the silver. They're very simple, they behave as plasmonics, or plasmonic particles, and actually there is a dipolar, again, electrical dipole oscillation. As soon as you apply electric field in this direction, you will have electric dipole in, this direct, in, in, in the same direction, and it will scatter. So one electric field applied, one dipole is excited. But in case of dielectric resonators, which we'll be talking to the, today about, yeah, you can have both electric dipole and magnetic dipole, and they're different. In the electric dipole, you have this kind of oscillation of electric field, and in magnetic dipole, the electric field will rotate around, yeah, and create magnetic dipole. Basically, in order to see all this nice phenomenon of nanoparticles, you need a material with very high contrast, with very high dielectric permittivity. Uh, most of the results which I will show will be devoted to silicon, which has a psion which is very close to uh, 13, 16 in, in the visible domain. Yes, so index of refraction is around 3.5 or 4. But there are also other materials like germanium or aluminum uh, antimonide. Yeah? And uh, they are being also used for this purpose. Uh, if you take a look at the scattering cross-section and the amount of power which is being scattered by nanoparticle, as function of the wavelengths. You will see that actually this silicon nanoparticle, in this particular case with radius of 70 nanometers, has two resonances. So there at low frequencies at large wavelengths, you have magnetic resonance and after that you have electrical resonance. And if you model this somewhere in, say, CST Microwave Studio or any software which allows you to see the fields inside, you will see that actually at these two resonances, the fields inside of the nanoparticle, they dramatically differ. Again, it's either this electrical kind of the mode is excited, then magnetic field is rotating around with electrical, or vice versa, when you have electrical field which is rotating. Uh, you can clearly distinguish these two peaks, and now you have uh, Completely different object. You have one nanoparticle with two responses. Usually the people are considering nanoparticle with only one response, usually plasmonic and usually one electrical dipole is excited. Right now we have competition of magnetic dipole and electric dipole from just a single nanoparticle. And you can play with this for different applications very, very, very seriously. Another important thing is that as soon as we have some metallic nanoparticle. You usually, if you create nanoparticles, say from gold or from silver, you clearly know the resonant frequency of this nanoparticle, and it's not really significantly depends on the dimension of this nanoparticle. The resonance is dictated by material properties in case of the plasmonics. But over here, if you can see the silicon nanoparticle or the electric nanoparticles, the resonance is dictated by dimensions of your particle. Take a look. If you have chosen uh, say 100 nanometers radius of, of, of nanoparticle, then electrical resonance will appear somewhere at 650 nanometers and magnetic resonance will appear at 900. If you would like to make a smaller nanoparticle, then resonance will shift to the low frequencies. So depending on the application, for example, you would like to tune your nanoparticle to operate in telecommunication wavelengths. Then you have to find 1,500 and find the proper 
proper radius of nanoparticle to operate. If you need very low frequencies, say uh, small sh short wavelengths, say 500 nanometers, then you have to take small nanoparticle. So depending on application, it's very, very easy to find nanoparticle which operates. So basically, if you take a look at this cross section, for small nanoparticle, usually you have magnetic resonance. If you enlarge your nanoparticle, then your magnetic resonance shifts with the frequency to low frequencies, to larger wavelengths. If you enlarge this radius even further, they again shift. So you can tune it, yeah? If you know how to manufacture this nanoparticle with proper dimensions, you can tune it for particular application without any problem. And this is dramatic, dramatic difference, yeah? Previously, the people were playing with plasmonic nanoparticles, trying to modify the shape of nanoparticle in order to fulfill these requirements. Over here, just the size, just the dimensions matter. All right, the simplest way how you, you can create uh, a nanoparticle, it's like uh, you're taking uh, uh, the femtosecond laser, launch the pulse onto silicon substrate, and if intensity is very large, you can make a large hole <laughs> by this femtosecond laser inside of your semiconductor. And will be an explosion of this silicon. Yeah, it will be melting in this area. It's like eruption of volcano, I would say. And some pieces of silicon will appear around. And these pieces of silicon will actually form nanoparticles of different sizes. And all these nanoparticles, because they have different sizes, they shine the light, they scatter the light at different frequencies, yeah? So this is the first experiment which, which was done, and actually the people observed these different dimensions, different nanoparticles of different dimensions, and observed these different scattering. And it was exactly the same like in the theory, so if you, if you, if you have uh, diameter of nanoparticle around 100 nanometers, we observed only magnetic resonance. And after that, if you have 140 or uh, 150 nanometers diameter, yeah, we observed both electric and magnetic dipole. But uh, such way of creation of nanoparticle, it's like a, a stone age, I would say, for development of the technology. Of course, nobody would like to create real nanoparticle for na nanoparticles for nanophotonics like this. Yeah, the people are using different methods. But at the very, very beginning, the people were picking up these nanoparticles from this thing, yeah, by pick and place technique, placing them at, at, at particular places and starting, is it really so that this nanoparticle has magnetic response? We were quite happy to do it with near field scanning optical microscope uh, for the first time in, in uh, 2015, when we uh, measure it, uh, the near field scattered by this nanoparticle at the substrate, on top of the substrate when it was located. And we were able to identify that really at magnetic dipole, which completely corresponds to the theory, you have particular scattering uh, geometry <laughs> of, of, of the field, which is completely different as compared to electrical dipole. Uh, because particles are very small and Theory, it's nice, concept is nice, but it always requires some, some verification. As soon as we have nanoparticles with magnetic response and you have strong magnetic fields there, you can manipulate the fields in a different manner. For example, you can have uh, hot spots for magnetic field. Usually, if the people were doing in plasmonics with metals, the people were doing hot spots for electric field. Because electrons concentrate some there, you have a small gap between of them. Okay, and you have hot spot of electric field. Over here, because you have magnetic response of dielectric nanoparticle, you can create magnetic hot spots. You can create actually both electric and magnetic hotspots, but in particular, magnetic hotspots are very interesting. For some quantum objects which require particularly magnetic field to be applied, this is the way when you can concentrate the field and create maximum of optical magnetic field without, without any problem. All right, uh, if you have just one nanoparticle, you can collect it, do experiment, but usually you need to create the real structures out of this nanoparticle. And actually, during last Five years, there were many, many different approaches how to fabricate them. I have to say that actually uh, there are three of them which are mainly used right now. One is laser printing, uh, already not just burning silicon substrate, but you're taking uh, a donor substrate, melt some uh, piece of silicon, and after that through the drop, you can create a drops on the glass. You can use chemical synthesis, then by chemical 
uh, uh, creation of the silicon nanoparticles, you can create even solutions of the silicon nanoparticles of necessary uh, site. And of course, classical way of lithography, which is not really actively being used for, in particular for silicon, because we have to make sure that silicon is pure one without any doping. And if lithography, we are usually getting some not really nice, nice silicon in terms of the crystallinity. This is the way how we are using this. We are using this laser-induced transfer thing. You, at the beginning, you are creating donor substrate using some uh, simple lithography techniques. Yeah, you can have a, quite fancy shapes of silicon something. And after that, by laser pulse, they are melting these pieces of silicon. They create drops, and these drops fall down. And after that, in the receiver substrate, we have very nice silicon nanoparticle. <clears throat> Mother Nature helps us over here because as soon as this uh, melted uh, liquid uh, silicon is passing through the air, it forms ideal sphere, and already ideal crystalline sphere fell down to the substrate, and we have very nice ideal spheres without any changes. Yeah? Uh, I will tell a little bit later about this fact, yeah, that actually depending on the distance between uh, donor substrate and receiver substrate, we can have a little bit different quality of the silicon nanoparticle which we have studied. But what you need to know that actually you can create this without any problem in the, in the lab and use it for, for different things. Okay, so this was a background story that actually just the, the silicon nanoparticles or all dielectric nanoparticles, they can be created, they create some enhancement, but still it was not clear how it can be used. And today we'll be talking about using of these silicon nanoparticles for different applications. Yeah? I will list now the next four slides, the most of applications which are known to me. And after that, I will go in details into some applications and some results which we, we have done. Yeah? So the first one, the most amazing ones, were, of course, done not in my lab, yeah? but I will mention them as well. One th important thing, that as soon as you have these electrical and magnetic dipoles uh, excited, yeah? you can have a configuration when you have very strong backscattering, very strong reflection. So basically, if you make an array of this silicon nanoparticle, you can create perfect mirror. Nothing is propagating, everything is reflected, and the thickness of this mirror made of dielectric of silicon is very, very small. It's quite, quite nice for, for various applications. Uh, because these nanoparticles, they, as you, we have seen, they can have a colors at different frequencies. Yeah? You can just use this technology for coloring. Yeah? If in some areas you create nanoparticles, say 100 nanometer diameter, in another 90 nanometer diameter, you can literally make uh, different colors. The people are just collaborating with people who are doing arts and making a whole portraits and very nice uh, arts uh, with the help of this coloring right now, at the different scales, by the way. Yeah? Another thing from this silicon nanoparticle is that actually you can not only control the frequency at which this particle resonating, but also you can control a phase with which this particle is scattering the light. And this phase is very important. For example, you can write different phases at the flat interface, and you can create a holograms by placing different nanoparticles in different places and launching the light, you can create three-dimensional images, holograms without any problem. Another thing is that as soon as you modify in plane the distributions of this nanoparticle, you can create, for example, beam steering devices when they used to have a propagation or uh, refraction of the lights with particular angle. Over here, by modifying the surface made of this nanoparticle, you can tilt the beams on necessary angles, which are required for particular applications without any problems. Another thing which you can do, you can create, for example, uh, flat lenses. By manipulating the face at the interface by these different dimensions of nanoparticles, you can create a flat lens which will focus the light with required numerical aperture, with required properties. Yeah? You just have to control these individual nanoparticles without any problems. And another thing, you can make uh, face plates. Yeah? You can just put different 
uh, pieces of the silicon nanoparticles with little bit different orientations, with different phase, and at the output of this device, when you shine in the light, you can have a vortices, you can have different orders, and so on. There's a bunch of the people around the world doing this right now. I have to uh, say that Federico Capas, uh, Yuri Kivshar, and other guys, family names are listed over here, they're doing all these things during last five years quite actively, and they continue to do it because this technology right now seems to be very, very convenient because it's silicon-based, yeah? And as soon as silicon-based, it means that we can use conventional uh, technologies which we are using to process silicon in order to do this, yeah? A little bit of melting, a little bit of processing, and so on. Uh, this was the plane of the phase. Yeah, what you also can play, you can play with losses and absorption in these nanoparticles. I will show you that actually you can have ultra-fast optical modulations. It's like an optical diet made from just one single nanoparticles. And you can make a selective optical heating, you, uh, which is even more efficient than just in the case of silica, uh, in case of gold or uh, silver nanoparticles. And also, you can even use it for data recording. You can not only save colors, as I was showing in the previous slide, but you also can use it for, for recording the data, reading and saving. Uh, interesting thing is that actually you can create nanoantennas out of these silicon nanoparticles. I will show you again how we can do it, but what is uh, important here is that you can have variety of these nanoantennas done for different frequencies, and you actually can control interaction between quantum emitters through these nanoantennas and far field. And vice versa, you can use effects of these quantum emitters inside of these nanoantennas in order to enhance typically quantum effects. Yeah? Like nonlinearity, you can enhance harmonic, second harmonic generation, you can increase Raman signal, you can increase photoluminescence with help of this nanoparticle. So the whole story of uh, uh, using of these large objects in terms of the quantum, like this. Uh, silicon nanoparticles as, uh, as a way of modifying the performance of quantum emitters, I would say. All right, now a few words about nanoantennas, which is pretty simple for me because I have radio engineering background, but during last 10-15 uh, years, we people started to do optical antennas. Usually we were doing microwave antennas, connecting it by RF cable, and after that we have TV, we have Wi-Fi and other things. But in optics, we also do need it, yeah? Take a look, the conventional antenna at the right, this is actually a matching device. You have some microwave or optical waveguide, you have antenna after that, and it match mode of this waveguide with the free space. In this sense, you either convert mode of the waveguide to the free space or mode of the free space into the waveguide. So you either have transmitting antenna or you have receiving antenna. Yeah? This is all, always used everywhere, in all our mobile phones and everywhere. But in optics, there is a very small draw, drawback. We don't have really tiny sublink waveguides. That's why in optics, the people do call nanoantennas any devices which either couple some near field of quantum emitters to the far field radiation or concentrate far field into the near field. It's a little bit different, but at the end of the day, all the antennas looks very, very similar to, 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 to what the people have in microwaves. Yeah? And, but applications are different. Yeah? These non-antennas are used for quantum sources. They're using for being used for medicine, into, for heating of the uh, cancer in microscopy, in nonlinear spectroscopy, in solar cells for better and efficient <laughs> solar cells and for sensors. Uh, the people, as I told you, are doing this already for quite a while. And the simplest way which researchers uh, decided to, do, to follow is just to mimic antennas which were available for microwaves. They took a dipolar antenna, monopole antenna, bow tie antenna, and even rhombical antenna, and uh, Yagi Uda, and just squeezed dimensions. Usually they should have dimensions of, say, centimeters. Right now they have dimensions of nanometers. And because usual conventional antennas are being made from metals, they decided to make it the same from the metals at the nanoscale. 
it was quite successful. The problem is that metal at microwaves, it's nearly lossless. But metal in the visible domain, it's extremely lossy. And a lot of fields are being dissipated into the heat in all these antennas. And we decided with silicon, with much smaller losses, that it's much, much, it will be much better. Okay? This is, again, the scattering uh, cross-section of single silicon nanoparticle. And right now, you have to take a look at these three points. Take a look. This is actually the points when you somehow have equal uh, values of electrical and magnetic dipoles or uh, electric and magnetic dipoles with opposite side. Uh, this means that nanoparticle at these frequencies will either uh, have a f completely forward scattering in the forward direction or completely backward scattering. And by this forward and backward scattering, you really can create antennas easily. You put your quantum emitter next to this nanoparticle. And after that, you see that it starts to radiate directively a single nanoparticle, either in the forward direction or in the backward direction. And by knowing this, how you have to operate this, so it's radiate either in forward or in backward direction. So it's either reflector or it's either director. And you can use it for creation of, say, Yagi-Uda antennas. What is Yagi-Uda antenna? You have some emitter, and after that, you would like to radiate power at the right direction. So you have to put directors, which will predominantly scatter in this direction, and one reflector, which will reflect the light. So the light will predominantly go to the right, and the direction uh, of, of, of emission will be very, very directive, like, like, like this over here. And all the power will go in this direction. It has been done, but for the first instance, numerically and experimentally, issues with substrate, issues with placing of the quantum dot over here, they're quite dramatic. What we have done, we decided to make a scaling. We scaled this structure back to RF, uh, to microwave frequencies. Yeah, we found very nice ceramic material, which has exactly the same dielectric permittivity as the silicon, but not in the visible domain, but at 10 gigahertz domain, yeah? And we created this <laughs> nano antenna with dimensions of centimeters. And in anechoic chamber, performed experiments and verified that everything is fine. Uh, after that, in, 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 in one year, our colleagues around the world have done this experimentally in optics without any problem. Uh, we didn't stop at this point, and we decided to think, all right, so if we can now create antennas out of dielectrics, Maybe we can create some different kind of antennas using this. And we started to think, OK, the main property of antenna is directivity. So it should emit light in one direction. How the people are doing this at microwaves? They're usually using either Udayagi antennas or lenses or reflectors. But all these devices are very large. And exactly the same idea is being now projected into the optics. Maybe in optics we can do something else. Maybe we can have high directivity not only due to large aperture of antenna, but due to something else. And if you dig somewhere deep in, 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 in the books, you will find that actually there is so-called effect called super directivity effect. Actually, directivity of antenna is dictated by area of electric field created by this antenna, but not the physical area of this antenna. And for some antennas, it happens that electrical area of antenna is much larger than physical area. And if it's so, then it's called super directive. And we observed this effect for single nanoparticle. If you have a hole of this nanoparticle, in, in notch inside of this nanoparticle, and place some dipolar scatterer, you can see the directivity of this guy dramatically depends on the location of this emitter with respect to this nanoparticle. This is x-axis. Zero is the center of nanoparticle. This gray area, it's inside of nanoparticle. White area, outside of nanoparticle. If this dipole is located outside of nanoparticle, then we have very small directivity around three, which I was showing you at the previous slides. But interestingly, as soon as this nanoparticle enters inside, you can have significant increase of directivity by three times. And you have already very, very directive emission but with single nanoparticle. So directivity is, is reaching level of 10, which is unpredictable. So usually, in order to get uh, directivity around 10, previously, take a look, you, you require to have one, two, three, four, five elements. Over here, you have directivity equal to 10 with just one single element. 
How can it be? It happens because you, inside of this dielectric nanoparticle, you cannot do it in metal. You have to use dielectric. You can excite higher order multiples. You can have very crazy fields inside, and these crazy fields inside of this nanoparticle with broken symmetry create very large effective aperture which radiate. Yeah? You basically, uh, we were, uh, basically were able to excite higher order multiples inside of this nanoparticle. So in addition to those electrical dipole and magnetical dipole, which we can excite from the far field by the plane wave. If we are placing the quantum emitter inside of our object, we can excite up to fifth order of multiples, which is something which is usually impossible. You need to use whispering gallery modes up to, up to fifth order in order to do this in regular case. Over here, it's being done automatically. And as a result, all these multiples are forming very, very nice directive beams. Uh, these beams are so directive that actually you can use it immediately, say, for subway rank uh, resolution imaging. If you change the source location over here inside of this, whatever, nanoparticle or nano lens, yeah, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, you have a rotation of the beam which is being emitted by this. Yeah? Over here, this is the angle of rotation as function of shift in terms of the nanometers. So in the far field, you will be able to detect shifts related to five nanometers, 10 nanometers with respect to the center by just the fact that you will see that emission changed by five degrees. Detection in the five field, uh, uh, the five degree angle change, it's very, very simple. Yeah? Uh, we verified this uh, in microwaves without any problem, created this nice uh, antenna and placed a dipole over there, moved it, and have seen an experiment that everything is working as I, I have shown to you uh, numerically in the previous slide. Uh, but the real optical uh, experiment, it's still a problem, yeah? You need a real uh, quantum source. We were thinking and continue to think about and the center in the diamond for this purpose. You need a real silicon nanoparticle. You need to place it properly on top of this and the center. Uh, there are three groups currently working in the world on this. Yeah, always there are problems with quality of the end center or with positioning. But at the end of the day, if you can do it, then you can extract by this uh, nanoparticle quite efficiently the power which is being radiated by these end centers independently on the substrate at which this end center is, 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 is located. Yeah, uh, I will probably skip this. Uh, crazy figures, but I have to tell you that radiation efficiency of this antenna is about one. It means that most of the power which is generated by this and the center will go to the free space. So this antenna is working as a matching device between this quantum emitter and the free space. In regular case, if you have and the center on top of the substrate, it will radiate into the substrate and the power will be absorbed in the substrate. Over here, it extracted and passes to the free space. And actually, it's even more efficiently extracts the power because it has very large personal factor. Personal factor reach the level of the 10 or 15 over here. So it's double performance. One performance is directive emission of, of the energy. And another one is a personal factor generated by this antenna. OK. And also, you can use this antenna as soon as it's ready, and if you can put it in, on top of the manipulator for, for imaging purposes for different angles without any problem. Uh, another interesting thing with these silicon nanoparticles is that, of course, if you have a competitor like a silicon photonics, then you have a silicon waveguides and so on. But even for silicon photonics, we can have a very nice device if you make an array, a line of these silicon nanoparticles. You can make a waveguide. OK, this waveguide is not better than just a silicon waveguide, but it has another nice property. Because there are so many bands uh, supported by this waveguide. For one of the bands, which literally really using magnetic and electrical moments of these nanoparticles, you can create waveguide which is uh, uh, not, not, not feeling any bending. So you can bend this waveguide by 90 degrees, and you will have total transmission without any scattering there. This happens because of this nice mismatching between electrical and magnetical dipole of these particles. And the light is just jumping by near field from one particle to another and being just passing through, through this edge without any problem. OK, mm, this 
what I was showing you, it was linear, mainly linear phenomena. Yeah, now it's time to talk about some nonlinear phenomena. One interesting nonlinear phenomena which we observed was that, of course, if you shine light with very large intensity on the silicon nanoparticle, then you can change properties of the silicon itself. It's very, very well known. The dialectic permittivity of silicon depends on concentration of free carriers. And concentration of precarious depends on the intensity of light which is shining on, on nanoparticle. If epsilon of this dielectric sphere is changing, the scattering will change. Yeah? And what we have done, we have done so that, for example, if you're shining low intensity light on this, in the nanoparticle, you excite only magnetic dipole. So it will radiate both in the forward and the backward direction, like this gray curve over here. But with high intensity, epsilon is changing. So the property of nanoparticle is changing, like we effectively change the dimensions of this. But dimensions remain the same, but the electric permittivity of the particle is changing. But the scattering is being changed, and you have this blue curve for scattering. So the particle starts to scatter more in the forward direction if intensity is larger. If intensity is small, then not. And we performed this experiment. What we have seen, we have seen an experiment that actually ratio of nonlinear reflection and this with large intensity and small intensity of this nanoparticle was about 15% from one single nanoparticle. So in a sense, you already can start doing some logic over here. So it, 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 it's really nonlinear logical device because it's like, like a diet. Yeah? With some intensity, you can, have, you can have a scattering in one direction. With another intensity, you will have a scattering in the opposite direction. Uh, in terms of publicity, this result was called like a smallest uh, optical dipole. Yeah? But right now, the problem is integration of this dipole into, in, in, into, into real devices. This is still, still a problem. Because as soon as you have uh, silicon, which is changing dielectric primitivity in one nanoparticle, it's a very bad idea to use silicon waveguides to, to put the power to, towards this nanoparticle. And this problem is not solved yet. Yeah? But probably, I mean, you can put this into some circuitry with required intensities and already use it like, a, like optical device. Uh, I was mentioning something about recording and, uh, of data and changing the colors. Yeah? We have done this thing as well. We decided that, okay, silicon, melting of silicon, it's too, too high uh, power. Yes, so in order to melt silicon, you need about 1,680 Kelvins. Yeah, uh, we decided to make hybrid systems. We decided to hybridize our silicon nanoparticles with plasmonic nanoparticles. We placed like a mushroom over here. The cap of this mushroom is made of gold, and this part is made of silicon. The good thing is that these two guys are melting at different temperatures. So what we can do, if we control intensity of light which we are shining, we can melt the head of this mushroom, and the, the remaining part will, 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 will stay there. So with small intensities, it can be like this. With very large intensity, you can make a sphere on top of it. Yeah? And we have done this quite effectively. This is uh, our experiment, depending on uh, amount of uh, power which we applied. We can either make this sphere over here, and after that, even we can burn the sphere, it will go out, yeah? And there is a certain theory over here. Good thing that as soon as dimensions, as soon as geometry is changing, the optical properties of this nanoparticle, hybrid nanoparticles, is also changing. And we have seen it. So basically, you can record some information there. And uh, from this state to that state, oops, sorry, from this state to that state, the difference in scattering is more than 100 nanometers. It's more than enough for, for, for any devices. Yeah? So this is the way how you can write data or change colors with, with the help of these hybrid nanoparticles without any problem. Uh, we started to think a little bit further. And we thought, OK, so we should have some nonlinear effects in these nanoparticles. What about uh, second harmonic generation? And second harmonic generation is very useful because we know that in the living tissue, uh, it passes very nice infrared radiation. But after that, we would like to have some kind of colors, light, 
coming in the visible domain for detection of different things. Yeah? And for this purpose, you need to convert infrared frequency to the visible domain frequency. For example, by, uh, uh, by second harmonic generation, by increasing frequency two times. Yeah? It's quite well known for many uh, nanoparticles made from different materials. And it's observable everywhere. Uh, but all these materials require uh, not center symmetric high index dialectics. So they require high two. The problem is with silicon, it's completely symmetric crystalline lattice. So we shouldn't expect any second harmonic generation out of silicon. But in experiments, we do. And this is very simple, actually. It's also known from the literature that this happens because of the interfaces. So if we could create a silicon nanoparticle, which is ideally spherical, which is very complicated, and completely crystalline, but we shouldn't have any K2 and nonlinear effects. But in reality, some interfaces will be a little bit rough, so on and so forth, and we will have K2. And in real nanoparticles, which we are using, K2 is very dramatic. Now I'm returning to this nice picture when I was showing to you that we are melting the silicon, cool it, crystallize, and after that, depose. Yeah? Uh, we analyzed what are the nanoparticles which are being obtained over here depending on the phase uh, and depending on the distance between donor substrate and silicon substrate. Take a look. Over here you have distances 220 nanometers, 250 nanometers, uh, 300 nanometers, and 350 nanometers. Yeah? You see that actually optical properties are very very different over here. It means that nanoparticles are always very different. Why it is so? We take a look at second harmonic generation. We have seen that second harmonic generation is very large over here. And it's much larger, at least 20 times larger, and even more than just a silicon, amorphous silicon film. Yeah? And it is because we have different state over here. Depending on the distance at, the, at, at which all these guys are flying, we either have amorphous silicon or nanocrystalline silicon or polycrystalline silicon. We do see it from the Raman signal from this silicon. Yeah? So we either have a maxima over here which is corresponding to amorphous silicon or sharp resonance to crystalline silicon. So just these nanoparticles, they, they are in the different state. And for nanocrystalline silicon, we have many, many, many islands of this silicon. And from these many islands of the silicon, we, we have very strong second harmonic generation. Because these islands do have a lot of interfaces. And all these interfaces generate second harmonic. Yeah? So we've got very nice efficiency over here. And of course, because these are nanoparticles, this efficiency is increased at the resonances, electric and magnetic resonances of these nanoparticles. Uh, and this is quite nice, I think. Uh, after that, we decided, all right, if for such simple uh, uh, effect like a second harmonic generation, we, we, we have improvement uh, by our resonators, what about Raman signal? Yeah? And we decided to see what's going on with the Raman. This is usual uh, way how we measure Raman scattering yeah, with objective and, and Raman spectroscopy. And what we have seen, we actually have seen that the fields inside of nanoparticle are being enhanced at our resonances. And there was a very strong expectation that Raman intensity will be also increased. And it's really happened. We observed at largest, so largest intensity was at magnetic resonance in this case. At the same magnetic resonance, we've got enhancement of Raman signal 140 times. And interestingly, it's not just enhancement of Raman signal. Uh, it's Raman signal coming from silicon. And uh, spectrum, Raman spectrum of silicon depends on temperature. It's very well known that the Raman shift as a function of temperature is dictated by some formula. Literally, you can see that shift is just linear with respect to the temperature. So by the shifting of the resonant frequency of Raman, I can tell you what is the temperature at the nanoscale at some parts of this nanoparticle without any problem. I can make a picture right now everywhere. It will be already temperature uh, in this scale, yeah, in Kelvins uh, for, for different uh, uh, nanoparticles with different sizes. Yeah, we compared this with uh, conventional 
uh, gold nanoparticle, yeah? And we see that actually depending on, on, on the frequency and dimensions, yeah, you, you have usually even higher temperatures which you can obtain there. And you can really map, uh, map the temperature distributions over here, yeah? So this is a temperature as function of the location for this particular nanoparticle, yeah? Taken from, from, from the Raman signal. Yeah, uh, yeah. They compare it with gold nanoparticle. Gold nanoparticle is is very has very flat response. There are maximas for uh, the silicon nanoparticle, and these maximas are quite nice. It means that you can have really better thermometry as compared to the same thing with with, with gold, for example. And this is example then with some uh, oligomers of these nanoparticles. We measure it. Uh, temperature distributions at different intensities. So I would say it's one of the new ways of thermometry at the nanoscale. Uh, it's a little bit tricky because it involves silicon nanoparticles, but at the end of the day, it gives you information which is usually not really accessible because with some resolution about nanometers, you can get uh, information about temperature. Okay, last among all these nonlinear effects, uh, which you can see again related to, to uh, Raman scattering. It's, we obtain it, uh, uh, we obtain the, uh, the, uh, the, the spectra of some native protein molecules in the system and we again combine our silicon nanoparticles, which is very good resonator on top of the gold mirror. Uh, how we did this? Uh, we of course measured this and found the areas where the field is very strongly localized and got uh, improvement of Raman intensity. And in, in addition to thermosensitive line of crystalline silicon, we are obtaining a spectrum of, of the protein on top of that. So we can both control temperature of the area from which we've got a signal and the spectrum of what is in this area, yeah? So we basically can trace molecular events, yeah? So we can know the temperature of our silicon nanoparticle and we can see what's going on with these organic mo molecules there, yeah? So what we have seen here, there was some chemical reaction of uh, or, uh, there. And depending on the temperature, we have seen it at a different stage, yeah? So this is, new area for me and for my group. But the people who are doing this, they're saying that this is really kind of, not really breakthrough, but step forward for understanding of this. It's another method of understanding what's going on at the nanoscale with these chemical reactions and really molecular events. Because in this gap between nanoparticle and, and, uh, and, and, and the mirror, there are only a few molecules and chemical reactions there are quite, quite Quite of good, quite of large interest for biology. Yeah, maybe the people who are doing biological studies can help me with this later in the discussions. Okay, last thing which we have done, we call it nano lamp. Uh, it's ultra broadband nanoscale light source, and we have created again it from silicon nanoparticle. Uh, at certain moment, we decided that. It's not enough to make a mushrooms from silicon and gold. Let's mix silicon and gold completely in the nanoparticle. And they melted silicon and gold under certain concentration. And after that, at the output, we've got nanoparticle where you have partially gold and partially silicon in different areas with certain concentration. Yeah? We have done it just for fun at the very beginning. But as a result, we observed extremely huge photoluminescence over here over here. It's very wide band. If you have silicon nanoparticle, then you have this kind of photoluminescence. If you have gold nanoparticle like that, if it's silicon gold, you see it's, it's, it's very large and very wide band. So it's really nanoscale, very small light source, like a white lamp, but nanoscale size. Uh, photoluminescence happens because of free photon photoluminescence and second harmonic generation over here. Uh, how it looks like? Actually, we can take this nanoparticle and put it on, onto the metallic tip. How we are doing this? Oops, it should be video. Video is not really working. Very, very pity. Sorry for that. 
it here, but for some reason you cannot see it. Okay, so actually uh, by, uh, by this probe mechanically, they are coming over here, picking up this nanoparticle and place it to another place. This is pick and place uh, technique. And actually as soon as this nanoparticle is already being placed on top of some uh, uh, tip of the uh, of this. This lamp can be used as a source for near field scanning optical microscopy. So you can put it on top and after that scan it on top of the cell, some structure. As you can see here, it's also supposed to be video, which is not working. Sorry for that. Um, all right. As a result, you can get a pictures of near field at very wide frequency range. Uh, without using different frequencies of, uh, of the laser, yeah? In, in the lab, we have tunable laser. We scanned the near field uh, with, the, with the tunable laser. And after that, we scanned the same near field. This is for our, uh, our dimer antenna, which we are very familiar with, with the help of this uh, tiny uh, white light source nanoparticle. We've got nearly the same results. I would say this is a new way of doing uh, the, the nanoscale sources, yeah, uh, which was quite successful, and we we are continuing to do this. There are some limitations: mixing of silver and gold, uh, sorry, gold and silicon for fun. It's one story, but we started right now to think about this more systematically, and more systematically. We really can create highly efficient uh, sources with tunable emission, with some broad range in the visible. It should be very good in terms of quantum yield, tunable. Uh, we can modify it by mere resonances, so we should have high refractive index and low cost of fabrication. Uh, gold is not appropriate for this purpose then. So we decided to switch materials, and what we are doing right now, we are using perovskites. Mm, perovskites were actually a new kind of material with strange geometry like this. So it should have two cations, A and B, and after that one anion forms this kind of geometry. The name perovskites is coming for Lev Perovsky, Russian minister who has nothing to do with research at all. He just gave a lot of money to researchers to go to Ural Mountains in order to dig, and they found this uh, in the nature of these perovskites. And now uh, these minerals are being called perovskites because of him. And actually right now we can easily synthesize these perovskites quite easily. We can choose this A, B, and X without any problem with different cations and anions. And you can create this perovskite by just that chemistry processing. You mix these things, you, you rotate this, heat, heat it up a little bit, at the end of the day you have these perovskites. What is good with perovskites? It's good that you can really control uh, the spectra of these perovskites depending on the materials and concentration of materials you put there. And it's extremely cheap. It's very low cost. It's wet chemistry and very simple synthesis. And we were lucky, we were lucky that actually it's very low loss high index dielectric. Yeah? These are three kinds of perovskites, this formula, this formula, and this formula, even don't know how to tell this, but good thing is they have different colors, they have different excitation peaks, yeah? And in experiment, you really can see the different three colors of this perovskite nanoantennas. So we have made these single nanoparticles out of these perovskites, and we are very happy, they are also very good light sources. Okay, so I came to the conclusion. What I wanted to tell you that actually in the area of nanophotonics, with just a single nanoparticle, still there is a room to investigate very many different phenomena for different applications, yeah? With simple silicon nanoparticles, we've managed to create many different antennas and find many different phenomena, for example, nanoheating, second harmonic generation, nanothermometry, and even create white light snobs. And it's still not the limit. We still have to search for different materials around us. In particular, we, we are trying to study perovskite now uh, because we believe that these are very good, uh, nice semiconductors uh, with a lot of features. And they are much cheaper than, say, silicon, which has to be processed in the different manner. Yeah, and all the electric nanoantennas, they really beat plasmonic ones. It may take a while for use of them 
in, in, in the real practice. But right now, it's already clear that this is next step towards creation of non-antennas. A lot of groups around the world are doing this silicon non-antennas right now. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.